Hello Legends. In this video, I'm going to go over the new NAN data tables. So data tables are a brand new feature, and this is how you can store structured data directly within your NAN instance. And to demo this, I've actually built out a kind of pseudo full stack app, which is a shift manager, which allows for two different types of access. So if you're an admin, right now it's not built out, but you can um, add users uh, like staff to your account. You can set their shifts and you can manage leave requests. And for this demo, we're going to pretend that we're an actual staff member and our options are going to be to actually see our shifts and then raise leave requests. So it's a kind of like, um, I don't know how useful this app is personally, but it's very interesting to see that now that we have uh, the ability to build a front end interface by using the form submission node, which we can actually use like form endings or next form page to dynamically change this interface here. Um, we've got the front end, then the actual workflow itself is the execution layer. And then the back end is the actual database that we have from these data tables. So um, yeah, we got really cool functionality here. So the very first thing we can check is uh, this login. So if we put in an email address, uh, bar at support launchpad, uh, let me just put the wrong information in. If I put the wrong information in and I submit this, we've taken the, um, we basically done a login check where we've passed in those, uh, those like credentials, so the email address and the password. We went across to one of our data tables, which is this credentials data table over here where I have my email address and password. And then we're using this if node over here to basically check, is there a discrepancy between what was submitted and what we returned from our credentials table? And since there was a discrepancy, we just showed like the next screen, which shows um, a login failure. And then for best practice, we're just logging that failed login attempt into our next data table. So we're just in credentials to try to get the uh, password login information. And then for logins, we can see the most recent one over here on the bottom was um, my email address, the workflow ID, and then the status of this login was failed. And that's why we had this dynamic page load up, which is basically saying bad login, sorry, those credentials don't match. So if we come back into here, let's just reset this and we use the correct login method now, the click correct login credentials. Okay, awesome. So we've logged into our account and what we've done over here is we've done the exact same check. So is there a mismatch between the credentials that were uh, gotten from a credentials database and then the submission from the actual form? The login check happened. We then had the, um, we took the login route. We inserted this login event into our uh, logins table. So if we come back into here, let's just refresh this. That's our most recent login attempt. So bar, the email address, the workflow ID, and then it was successfully logged in. And then the next thing we did after the successful login was we actually went to see uh, what's the actual access type here. So this is like looking at uh, different users and the roles that they have within this uh, app. So we pulled in the access type and that access type was this users table over here. So my login for the email address was staff. And then for example, Andrew at, my, at the same business was an admin user. So in this case, we're just checking if the user is admin and if they are admin, they will take this route. Uh, but since we're staff, we're taking the staff route. So then we display the actual options for ourselves and the options are we can either see the shifts or make a leave request. So in our case, I'm just going to go to see shifts. I'm going to submit this form. And now the very next thing that we did was we went across to the shifts table and then we basically brought in all the shifts that we had. We generated a dynamic HTML and then we inserted that into, these, um, into the actual form. So the cool thing about the form node is that you can actually insert um, a small amount of HTML. So that's how we were able to dynamically take the shifts and then just display them over here. So back in our data tables, we come back into here and then we had this shifts. So once again, just email address here is our main identifier, start time, end time, and then the date of the shift as well, which is what we're seeing over here. So all we've done is just basically take all this stuff and then bring it into the uh, form node. And then our final option is to actually download the shifts for this week. So I can just click on download over here and then I can just download from my browser. And this is essentially just an export of that data table. So all the key information here for that specific user, so their email address, the start and end time, and then the date column as well. And then our final end screen just shows, all right, thank you very much, your download's available now. So then the cool thing is uh, we actually went through the staff route, which is just like showing the options of, um, you know, do you want to see your shifts? Do you want to download your actual roster? Do you want to make a leave request? Uh, but if you take the admin route, you can actually add some other functionality to it. You can kind of cloak it behind the workflow logic that's possible or that's basically presented to that user. So in this case, maybe um, adding removing staff from the app, adding removing shifts or actioning leave requests. So this is all possible with the admin route. And since we're using the same unified databases in the back end, so these data tables, um, everything's going to be uh, basically consistent across both login versions of the app. Now, I don't think that I would take this app into production, but I just wanted to show that um, data tables are actually pretty cool because it gives us like the fact that we had a full stack app that was built. We had the front end, which is the UI of that uh, form node. We had the orchestration layer, which is this workflow. And then for the back end, we natively had the new data tables. This is like taking a step in a really interesting direction with NAN because um, yeah, up until now, you would have to like stitch different tools together. And I mean, you still kind of do have to stitch these different tools together, um, but it's becoming more of a unified experience.
Okay, so now I want to take some time to make a comparison between uh, other databases that you might be using for NAN. So we'll be looking at Google Sheets, Airtable, and Superbase. So the first and most important comparison is that these databases are actually production ready. So if you're running business critical tasks, um, I would actually stick to one of these databases or whatever you're already using. Um, data tables has been out for like a week and even NAN tells us not to use it for anything production ready. So you can see here in the UI, it's tagged as still in beta mode. And then in their implementation code for this new module, it says over here, the data table module is experimental and subject to change. Any tables added before the official release may become inaccessible at any point, so use it at your own risk. So what that actually means is uh, similar to when you're building out your NAN workflows, you don't just build out the very first version of your workflow and then don't even test it and then push it live so that it's like responding to customer questions or it's processing payments or it's doing some kind of business critical task for you. What you would actually do is you would chunk it down, you would split it up into stages, you would build out the first stage, you would test it, you would break it, you would fix it, and then you might push that into production. And then you might start on stage two, same thing. You would build it, you would test it, you would break it, you would iterate that process um, until it's working, and then you push it out into production. So those same principles apply when you're building out any kind of like app or solution. So that's what's happening here with data tables. It's the first version, this is their development environment. Um, they're putting it out to get feedback from people. Um, and it might be possible that when they're building out the data tables, like infrastructure in the back end, um, just like when you're building out a workflow, you might build it first and you might realize, oh shit, like this section, I just have to delete this thing entirely. And actually I just need to bring all this forward. And then I have to like remap all this stuff over here. So it's not like, it's not super common that this kind of stuff would happen, but it's also not uncommon. So NAN is just giving us a heads up saying that like, hey, like we want to build this out. We want to get feedback first. And then we're going to be building it out incrementally and fixing all these bugs, but there probably will be bugs and just be ready for it. Like don't run anything um, mission critical within data tables just yet. So now zooming into Google Sheets. So Google Sheet, as you know, it's like Excel, but on the internet. Um, this is like a very basic data storage solution. So if you're building out personal automations, you might actually start with something like Google Sheet. Or if you're actually building out business automations before you go to Airtable, um, I think this is like a very easy stepping stone for everyone. They just start with Google Sheet. Um, as you would know in Excel and same thing with the online version of Google Sheets, you can do other things within the actual cells. Like you can have, um, you can run equations within those cells. You can base triggers off those cells. If uh, something is updated or added into Google Sheet, you can actually fire off events like this. Uh, then the bottom over here, so you can go to triggers. Um, so this in general for like databases as a uh, feature of a database, just like triggering events based on a new row was added, something is updated. Um, this kind of stuff, you cannot, do it in that, you cannot do it in data tables just yet, but this is a very common solution. For example, if you're building out an outbound caller, um, and then you're plugging in all your data from your form into Google Sheet. Every time a new row is added, like a new lead is added into that space, it could trigger off an event in an NAN so that you actually call that customer up. So right now with data tables, that's actually not possible. Well, actually, no, that, that's a lie. So actually everything is possible. Um, under the hood, if you were to do that, like it's technically just an automation that's happening natively within Google Sheets or yeah, Airtable and Superbase do this as well. Um, but what you probably would do is just get a scheduled trigger that just checks like, I don't know, every second or every minute, um, gets all the rows out of the database in question, it then logs how many rows and like that metadata and kind of caches it in a separate database with a timestamp. Um, and then it basically com compares the difference between the cached ver cached, last cached version of that database uh, versus the actual current status. And if there's any new rows, it just like takes the rows out and it processes them. So technically speaking, you can build automations for data tables to bring up the features um, and a functionality. But I think over time, like this is going to be um, native to data tables and, and I and we'll just run this in the back end. So yeah, that'd be like my first uh, comparison. So like Google Sheets for like personal automation or for like simple data sets. And then you have um, business automation. So like Airtable will handle uh, different data structures. Um, it's a bit more API friendly um, and it's able to like run some you know different functions and basically different things within Airtable that makes your life easier when you're working with data. So like maybe a little bit better filtering as well. So uh, for this one, let's stick on the point of like API friendly. Um, right now, data tables does not have a public API. But in their documentation, I think they actually have a REST API. So I tried hitting this REST API from my own um, NAN account, and I couldn't get authorized for it. So uh, there's a chance that I did that incorrectly. But what I uh, believe is happening is that the actual data tables that we're interacting with here is just the UI. It's not the actual table itself. So the storage of this when you're adding a table, when you're adding um, some columns, when you're adding some cells into your table, uh, there's like this um, orchestration layer between this UI of the table and then the actual table storage itself. And I think the backend for NAN just uses those API calls to get and retrieve and, and basically like manipulate that data between the front end and then the back end. But what it does show me is that like if there is like if there's this REST API in the back end that uh, NAN is using, 
maybe eventually they'll make it like public facing. Um, the actually the other comparison I wanted to make here as well is like when using Airtable or Google Sheets, you can actually access these even if you don't have like if you're not part of the same um, account or ecosystem. So you can just make these like publicly accessible. Whereas if you're using data tables right now, it's only limited to whoever has access to your actual account. Um, now, the final thing I want to compare against is like Superbase. So let's say this is like personal use. This is for business use. And this might be for like a SaaS app. If you want to build an app that you have multiple users, or if you have like just in general, like you're an enterprise business that you have like, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, like really crazy security requirements. If you're working with really complex data sets, like these like beefed up use cases, then you would use something like Superbase. So some of the things you get with Superbase is things like um, native authentication. So what we saw over here with this app uh, for the email and password, this is not an actual like best practice way to do this. I think for like maybe a local development testing app that you're just using for yourself or whatever, um, this like, you know can kind of get away with doing this kind of look up and check. But Superbase actually has um, actual uh, email and password login. They have like one-time pins. Um, I think they integrate with third parties. So you can actually do like Google uh, Google account um, OAuth login as well. So like that's one thing that you get here when you have this kind of database. Um, also, you have like it's a SQL-based database. So SQL is like structured query language. Um, it's like uh, like when you're doing filtering, like one of the most important things that you want to do with your database is be able to like store data appropriately and then be able to make that data usable for yourself. And part of the usability comes from the storage itself, but also from like the searchability. So um, Superbase actually is like a relational database. And a relational database is, um, I spoke about it in some of my recent videos, but it's basically like, um, it's a way that you structure your data where all the data points are actually can be interrelated. So for example, if you've got an e-commerce store, you might have like a customer's table where you have the customer's first name, last name, and in this case, they have the age as well. But you have a unique ID that's specific to this customer. And then you have a separate table where you're storing all the orders for your entire business, not just for one customer. Um, this is how you actually build scalable databases. So then over here, you're actually using this person ID from here, which is one. Uh, and you've got like this person is actually placed these two orders. So person three, Peterson, has placed these two. And then you can see by the person ID, person number two, which is Svensson, has placed this order. And then you can kind of keep going like this. So this is known as like a foreign key, which NAN doesn't have um, in their uh, database. And actually Google Sheets and Airtable don't have this natively either. Um, but a foreign key is like really good for your database because it maintains, for example, the integrity of the information that you have. Because if I, if I, like, let's say I came into here and I want to add a new order and I want to use person ID four. there's no person ID four in my, uh, in this table, for example, where it says um, person ID, my person's table. So I'd actually get a warning over here or like I wouldn't even be allowed to add that um, order into here. So it just makes the integrity, the accuracy of my data um, even better. So at a high level, when you're using a SQL-based uh, search method or a database, you're able to create these expressions for searching um, that are really comprehensive. So you're actually able to search across like very um, like minute bits of metadata. So if you're storing product information, for example, um, where you have the product, you might have the material, you might have the dimensions, the weight, the origin, the availability, all these bits of information, you actually have a better time of filtering and searching when using uh, SQL statements. So I didn't mean to go too off track there, but actually uh, this is a really important part of people's databases. So I actually see quite a lot of videos if people want to build like product catalogs for their own business, where you've got a lot of products and they're all very dynamic. People typically build something out in Superbase using like these SQL uh, queries and commands. So to summarize all the differences here, the most important one is that uh, data tables are still in, is still in beta mode. So don't use it for anything production ready just yet, like definitely test it out, but it could and probably might change. So just be mindful of that. If you're already using, you know, Google Sheets or Airtable Superbase, yeah, don't, I wouldn't transition just yet. Um, you can only access the table within NAN, uh, within the NAN account. Um, there's no triggers. We spoke about that workflow hack, but maybe that's just unnecessary overhead for now. Um, no SQL, but Google Sheets and Airtable also don't have SQL. So if you're using these things, um, there might not be too much of a difference. No foreign key, which is that thing we spoke about between um, like relationships between tables. So you had the uh, order table and then you had the um, user or the, the actual customer table as well and how they're interrelated. Um, and then, yeah, this is just like a separate note for something else I was thinking about. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. If you've watched to the end of the video, I feel like you'd be the 10% of people um, that watch my channel that are actually interested in uh, more of the technical details. Um, so if you were to come down into the school community, I'm going to share this workflow that I had at the start of the video, which is that like shift manager app. Um, so you can take this and play around with it as well. I'll include information of how I set up these tables. So like I'll probably just screenshot all these different tables and you can just replicate this for yourself as like a nice mini project. Otherwise, you can just come into here and speak with other like-minded people as well. All right, guys, thank you very much and I'll see you in the next one.